Excuse me, the log. Alright, guys. Alright, we have made it to the first night of summer. We are here. It is officially summer of 2023 and uh, I don't actually have the heater on but I do have a sweatshirt flannel pajamas and my Uggs on on this chilly it is a Wednesday night June 21st 2023 as the rest of the planet like all of my friends down in the great state of Texas broiling alive today here we are on another chilly night in paradise so I won't complain looking at the way it could be going uh, but anyway so kicking off the summer of 2023 I have been cleaning out the garage today is what I have been doing what I have been doing today so i am just good lord, good lord it is 10 18 and i'm just now getting around and guys i can't really decide on uh what i want is the summer of 2023's chronicle of the collapse so i think we're just going to do a little three for wednesday i love this one uh from some retired climatologist he is a retired climatologist by the name of uh, Stephen Gaughan, G-H-A-N, I guess that's Gaughan. And he is uh, writing an opinion piece, I guess. A majority of kids think the planet is doomed. Here's how to help reduce their anxiety. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, well, this is going back to December of 2021, 18 months ago is when this study was. I would like to see the new figures. A global study of climate anxiety in 10,000 16 to 25 year olds published in Lancet in December of 2021 found that 59, 59% were very or extremely worried about climate change. 83%, 83% of 16 to 25 year olds felt people have failed to take care of the planet. 56, 56% of these kids concluded that humanity is doomed. All right, fifty-six percent concluded humanity is doomed, and thirty-nine percent are hesitant to have children. Okay, so you can assume with these thirty-nine, the, the, the these thirty-nine percenters, that the fifty-six percent of kids who concluded that humanity is doomed includes that 39%. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just uh, going on a hunch here, guys. So that means 17% of 16, 20, 25-year-olds conclude that humanity is doomed and 30, 17% concluded that humanity is doomed and have no problem bringing children into a planet where their species is doomed. There you go. I, I, I you know, I, I think that says more about uh, why the planet's in this shape is in than anything else. Uh, okay, so if you have children, so of course this story does not apply to me because I have a brain and therefore I don't have children, but for those of you who do not have a brain and do have children, what can you do about their climate anxiety? Okay, so 
you, you know, I guess first you could admit that they would have no climate anxiety. They would not feel that humanity was doomed if they had never been born. So tell your child, if I had had a brain, if I had been thinking with my big brain instead of my little brain 16 to 25 years ago, uh, I would have understood that humanity is doomed and I would have been hesitant to bring you into the world. So this is the first thing you tell your children that somebody who is never born will never have climate anxiety. Will not happen. Will not happen. 100% guarantee that someone who is never born will never have climate anxiety. So that's the first thing you tell them. And then once you've gone through that, then it is time to form and execute a family climate preservation plan to reduce your household carbon emissions. Yeah, so uh, unless they're talking about a murder-suicide pact. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I love these. <coughs> How about this idea? for your 16 to 25 year old, embrace bicycles as a convenient, healthy, and enjoyable mode of local transportation and replace at least some of your consumption of beef and lamb with delicious vegetarian or chicken dishes. Now, I actually, uh, guys, you know, I don't eat beef, but I do eat chicken that I have uh, replaced a lot of my beef uh, dishes with chicken. So, I guess, uh, now, I don't know how it would have gone over it. I, I made this decision in my 40s not sure how it would have gone over if my mother had suggested that I put down that, uh, you know, whatever it was I was eating, some Burger King double whopper with cheese. And, uh, and what did it say? Replace that uh, Burger King whopper with cheese with a delicious vegetarian dish. I, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, that's going to go over as well as uh, now that they got their driver's license. The day they get their driver's license is age 16, you suggest to them to take a bicycle as a convenient and enjoyable choice for transportation. Anyway, okay, this next one was probably going to be my full length rant today. Why cutting down trees may be, may be the best way to save forests from wildfires. So here is uh, a picture of how to save a forest from a wildfire. You know, cut down the forest. You know, it's kind of like a tree that does not exist, a tree that has been cut down and uh, assumedly hauled off and turned into a tiny house. Uh, is never going to burn. So this is kind of like, you know, the same logic that a, you know, a person that is never born uh, it, it's never going to die in a wildfire. I guess since the tree was already born, I guess what we could do is sterilize the trees of the planet. I wonder if we can uh, sterilize every tree on the planet to keep any trees from being born. But as long as they are born, 
and they're standing there. They can't run away from a wildfire. So you cannot argue with the fact that the best way to keep a tree from burning down in a wildfire is to take a chainsaw and cut it down. Uh, I have cut down hundreds of trees uh, on my own property uh, in the past year. Uh, I guarantee you not one of those trees that I have cut down on my property is ever going to burn down in a wildfire. This is, you know, this is real rocket science. Uh, so what is happening as wildfires like the ones that blanketed and are blanketing in the northeastern U.S. in smoke become more frequent and more powerful, governments are adopting new approaches, new approaches to protect forests and the communities, meaning the humans that live near them. Uh, the most significant thing they're talking about is a new emphasis on a strategy experts call fuels reduction ridding forests of the materials that allow fast-moving megafires to develop, otherwise known as trees. Uh, you cannot burn the forest for the trees. Is that the, is that the bumper? You can't, you can't burn the forest for, you, you cannot burn a forest with no trees. There you go. So early last year, the U.S. Forest Service announced a plan to treat, to treat, treat more than 50 million acres of forest across the country over the next 10 years to make them less susceptible to fires by uh, cutting them down. Uh... Forest thinning is a similar process to prescribed burning, where you just burn the little trees down, but done by humans. Yes, and sometimes it is nothing more than individuals on foot trimming small saplings. In other cases, forest thin thinning involves using heavy machinery to cut down full-grown trees to make forests less dense and create fire breaks. So why is there debate uh, about forest thinning? When it comes to forest thinning, especially when it includes knocking down living trees, uh, you, you know, we, we got a debate about this. Advocates who, you know, are advocating knocking down trees to save the forest, who include most forestry leaders in the federal and state governments, say it is crucial to prepare forests so wildfires that will inevitably come are more manageable. Yes. Uh... Okay, and that goes on. Okay, so what's the other side of the debate? Uh, critics of the practice, including several environmental groups, question how effective forest thinning is at reducing the potency of forest fires and say it does serious harm to wild ecosystems. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, cutting down carbon-absorbing trees, they argue, works directly against the goal of, you know, sucking that carbon out of the air, which is what's making, you know, what I'm saying. Uh, others have no issue with clearing low-lying brush and grass but say large-scale thinning can often be used as a guise to allow logging in vulnerable forest. Can you say green washing? 
so anyway, so what they do, and they, they, you know, is they, is they have about twelve or fifteen quotes from people on various, uh, you know, si sides of the spectrum, uh, and. Okay, just a couple of them that I like. This is William Andereg, professor of biological science at the University of Utah. Quote, when the whole forest, when the entire forest is a dry tinderbox, having one area where you've done a fuels reduction may not be anywhere near enough to reduce the fire risk. So I guess he is advocating cut the whole goddamn forest down. You know, if you want to stop a forest fire, stop the forest. So I guess th th that Dr. Andag is suggesting we cut the entire forest down. Anyway, we are not doing nearly enough to tackle the root of the problem, which is climate change. Uh, Okay, good. Let's see. This is Jack Cohen, Jack Cohen, a wildlife researcher. The belief people have is that some way or another, we can thin our way to low-intensity fire that will be easy to, to suppress, easy to contain, easy to control, Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, two more. Here is Chad Hansen, forest ecologist. Uh, the Biden administration is telling the public they need to thin small trees and underbrush. The public hears that and they think pruning shears. They don't realize this is actually bulldozers and chainsaws. These are industrial commercial logging operations. Uh, one more. I don't know who Brian Minch is. It doesn't tell us. Logging requires road building and skid trails leaving lasting ecosystems damage, soil compaction, surface erosion, increased stream sedimentation, degraded water quality and aquatic habitat, reduced biodiversity, spread of invasive vegetation, and suppression of forest regeneration. Nearly 85% of forest fires are human-caused and roads invariably increase human presence in the forest and ultimately more fires. So guys, I anyway, this is just, uh, you know, this debate, this forest thinning debate is just one more of these uh, frying pan versus the fire debates unfolding uh, on, on this planet in the 21st century. You know, compared to geoengineering uh, and the the Green New Deal and, the, and all of these big frying pan versus the fire debates, I mean, this one is small potatoes, <clears throat> but it is a classic example. It doesn't matter, okay? This is one more uh, 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 of these spurious, is that the word, spurious debates, uh, d just a bunch of blah, 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 the forests are doomed, okay, the trees are doomed, they're all dying, uh, if the wildfire doesn't get them, the beetles will, uh, you know, go ahead and cut them down and make a tiny house while you still can. Uh, it, it, good Lord, it, it makes no difference. Now this last one I need to be uh, careful of on this channel. I'm just going to kind of read it and uh, 
somewhat bite my tongue. Once starved by war, millions of Ethiopians go hungry again as the U.S. and the U.N. pause aid, you know, food aid for starving Ethiopians after massive theft. Anybody who wants to know what the collapse of a planet looks like. This is what it looks like in Ethiopia today. Uh, I remember a South Park. Do you remember that hilarious South Park about Sally Struthers? Uh, <laughs> I might be dating myself. If you're under 50, you don't even know who the hell Sally Struthers is. I I anyway, that was a great South Park about Sally Struthers leading an Ethiopian food aid campaign. Uh, you know, so they're talking uh, about all these starving people uh, as the U.S. and the U.N. demand uh, that Ethiopia's government yield its control over the vast aid delivery system supporting one-sixth of the country's population. They have taken the dramatic step of suspending their food aid. All right, to Africa's second most populous nation until they can be sure it won't be stolen by Ethiopian food officials and fighters, uh, blah, 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 uh, and interviews with the AP, uh, which first reported the massive theft of food aid officials with U.S. and U.N. aid agencies, humanitarians, humanitarian organizations and diplomats offered new findings on the countrywide diversion of aid to military units and markets. Uh, that included allegations that some senior Ethiopian officials were extensively involved. The discovery in March of enough stolen food aid to feed 134,000 people for a month in a single town is just a glimpse of the scale of the theft that the U.S. Ethiopia's largest humanitarian donor is trying to grasp. The food meant for needy families was found instead for sale in markets or stacked at commercial flour mills still marked with the U.S. flag. The implications for the U.S. are global, uh, proving it can detect and stop the theft of aid paid for by you paid for by U.S. taxpayers uh, is vital. You know, with Biden being a big supporter of this. Uh, at a private meeting last week in Ethiopia, U.S. aid officials told international partners that this could be the single largest ever diversion of food aid in any country, aid workers said. Uh donated medical supplies were also stolen with US aid giving Ethiopia's government 1.8 billion dollars in humanitarian assistance in the last year uh, a delay in providing food aid causes widespread pain uh, blah 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 now the hunger is being traced to corruption. Preliminary findings released this month by regional authorities said they have tracked the theft of more than 7,000 metric tons of donated wheat or 15 million pounds 
in their region taken by federal and regional authorities. Uh, Ethiopia's government dismisses as harmful propaganda the suggestion that it bears primary responsibility for the disappearance of aid, blah, blah, blah. Guys, you, you know, and obviously nowhere, nowhere in, in this story uh, about food aid to Africa does it mention the word population. Or over, overpop, you'll never see the word overpopulation. You'll never see the word population. It doesn't say, uh, it doesn't even give the population of Ethiopia uh, in 2023. Sure as shit doesn't give the population of Ethiopia 50 years ago. My guess is the population of Ethiopia 50 years ago was about one-fourth of what it is today. Not one of this, uh, bit, any of this mentioned. And, uh, you know, and, and this is the thanks that these uh, little bleeding heart, uh, you know, uh, lefties get. Uh, $1.8 billion of U.S. taxpayers' money to be feeding all of those people who never should have been born, and, and all this all this food aid does is, is keep them just fed enough to keep the cycle going forever, and, and then their own government steals it. The, you know, steals it and and, uh, and sells it uh, at the market for uh, all of their uh, rich, rich... Anyway, guys, it's time to cut the crap. Food aid to Ethiopia. Please. Anyway, I've got to wrap up this rambling chronicle in the collapse, but I realize I'm talking to myself, and uh, I might have to dig out the heater. So get out there and enjoy the summer of 2023 while well, you still can. Are you enjoying the first day of the summer of 2023, little dog? Little dog actually has not been feeling good today. He's had a bellyache. You've had a bellyache. Why do you have a bellyache? Oh, man. I'm tired. Bye, guys. Yes, little dog.